I have to address the big red letter in the room. The Mr. Plinkett reviews by Red Letter Media are probably the best analysis of the Star Wars prequels on the internet. You think to yourself, that was weird, but I'm not gay. You are. You are gay. Patience. Use the force. Think. <laughs> so anyway, they catch the assassin and they find out that she is a shapeshifter. Now, this is just screenwriting 101, but why is she a shapeshifter? What does this actually bring to the plot of this story? Does she at any point shapeshift in this movie to affect the story? Nope. She doesn't even shapeshift to affect the story. What about all the cool shit in the scene? What are you talking about? Okay, but you know what? You brought up a flaw, but you know what? The tension, buildup, and cinematography behind the scene at the bar was incredible. They had moments that even had a poetic connection to A New Hope. It was done so well, with so much attention, detail, depth, and weight. Moments, silence, and buildup. And you're not acknowledging what they got right in that? Even when they're looking for her in the bar, this would be a great opportunity to have her turn into something else to avoid being found. But no, she doesn't do it. Why did George make her a shapeshifter? The characters bring it up in a way that shows that it might be significant. And I think she's a changeling. In that case, be extra careful. But if you go back into this movie and you pretend that she's just a regular person, it doesn't change anything. These are just the basic rules of writing a story. Now this scene is funny to me because if you take it and try to figure out exactly what's happening and why it's happening, it becomes hilarious. So I'm gonna have everybody try to follow along with me real quick. So Palpatine needs Padme dead, but he doesn't want to do it himself. So he asks Count Dooku to go kill Padme, but Count Dooku doesn't want to do it himself. So Count Dooku asks Jango Fett to go kill Padme, but Jango Fett doesn't want to do it himself. So he asks his shapeshifter friend to go kill Padme. Dude, yes, and bounty hunters sometimes send other bounty hunters to do their job. And with the technological advancements of their society, yes, they may even send a robot. So who cares? Technology is advanced. Holy shit, go figure. They sent another person to do it. So what? How is that a flaw? How if the job gets done anyway, so who cares? But the shapeshifter sends a robot to go kill Padme. And if you really want to be an asshole and get even more granular, the droid says, I'll send these little bugs to go kill Padme. Palpatine sends a man who sends a man who sends a shapeshifter who sends a robot who sends bugs to go kill Padme. And what's even funnier is that after they chase the robot and the shapeshifter, Django has a chance to go kill Padme. But instead, he goes out of his way to assassinate the person he hired to assassinate Padme. Secretly genius these prequels are. Many original ideas these movies have. The prequels, while suffering from flaws, were most definitely Star Wars stories. Shut Plus, when she got caught, she was going to reveal Jango Fett's identity. So to protect his identity, he killed her. That was why, and again, she was being interrogated prior. So that part was really just you not watching the film, just saying. So Obi-Wan manages to track down the assassin, and he finds him on a planet called Kamino, a planet where they are growing clone soldiers. And what is truly strange to me is that wise Jedi Master Obi-Wan goes to this planet where he literally sees the clones being grown and trained and he learns that Jango Fett is the man that the clones are based on. Jango Fett lives in this facility. He also learns that Count Dooku hired Jango Fett, and he later finds out that Count Dooku and Jango Fett are evil. And yet never at any point does he figure out that Dooku and the clones are connected in any way. Obi-Wan Kenobi is given all of the information to figure out that the clones were paid for by the bad guys. And yet it doesn't matter because I guess he just forgot. If Obi-Wan just remembered that Dooku and the clones are connected, he probably could have stopped the whole war. That was your problem? The fact that, oh no, how did Obi-Wan not connect Dooku to it all when investigating Kamino? Um, Dooku used to be in the Jedi Order, so they might not have expected him to out of the blue be connected to all that at once, or even the odds of that. Someone who used to be in the Jedi Order would be connected to Jango Fett, Palpatine, and the clone army? What are the odds of that? Uh, you're bringing stuff that isn't even an issue. 
but you just said your issue is Dooku. What are you saying? Oh, now the issue is that they got paid by the bad guys? Okay, but you just said the real issue was that Obi-Wan didn't connect the dots that it was Dooku. Now it's the bad guys overall? Okay, dude, I'm confused. What's the problem or flaw again? If you're gonna get on a movie, point out a legitimate issue. Obi-Wan Kenobi is given all of the information to figure out that the clones were paid for by the bad guys. And yet it doesn't matter, because I guess he just forgot. If Obi-Wan just remembered that Dooku and the clones are connected, he probably could have stopped the whole war. He could have saved the galaxy. It's such a small thing that would have changed the entire course of the Star Wars saga. And it's just based around Obi-Wan forgetting a crucial piece of information. So anyway, that's the A plot, and it's dumb as fuck. But meanwhile, I can't even wrap my head around what you're spouting, it's that confusing. You're saying that if Obi-Wan knew the most obscure outlandish information that he would be able to stop the war? Oh, it just happens that randomly a person we train in the Jedi Order is behind it all. How would anyone even assess that or figure that out? You'd have to investigate. Which Obi-Wan did, and even if you did, you might not get all the answers. He did confront Jango Fett and discovered the clone army so again how is that an issue just because he didn't connect dooku he still figured out all these other elements so does that really matter um no again if you're gonna bring up a flaw bring up some actual stuff in the movie that's a problem don't bring up things in the movie and say oh it's an issue and there wasn't even a flaw there to begin with that's not a flaw that's not a problem that's just you claiming there is an issue where there is none we have the B-plot, and it's just as bad, because George Lucas does not understand romance. In this movie, we get to watch Padme and Anakin flirt and go on dates, and this wouldn't be too bad if it wasn't so painfully written. Half of the shit they say to each other is pretty cringe, bro. Hear everything soft and smooth. Oh. Now, I wouldn't say that these two characters don't have any chemistry, because it's not really like that at all. I think that they could have made something work if they were better directed and if they had a better script. The romance scenes. Yes, Sand is rough, coarse, and gets everywhere. That's symbolism, genius. That's because he grew up on Tatooine, so he grew up in a bad, rough, poor environment, so Sand reminds him of that. Then Padme and Anakin also talk about what they would do with political power and they just talk about life. So the fact that you, like many others, blew this out of proportion is shocking when the original trilogy had some ridiculously corny moments. Oh, you flubbering nerf herder. Who's fluffy looking? The OT gets away with that level of corniness, but oh no, there's some romance? Look out. Nah, that's a double standard. Don't even go there. I mean, look at the scene where Anakin talks about how he just murdered a village full of people. This is how you can tell it's the director's fault, not the actor's. I killed them. I killed them all. Natalie, can we uh, get a reaction to this, please? Any reaction. George, that's your job. Tell her what to do. Help her help you, George. So these two really dumb plots converge on Geonosis, where we can have our dumbass final battle. And the end of this movie has now devolved into a dumb CGI action climax, and I personally cannot stand it. Action is kind of boring if it just shows up for no reason. So then, to end it all, we have a lightsaber fight, and it's probably the worst one in the entire series. He's showing the Yoda and Count Dooku fight. Yo, this is one of the best and most iconic fights in the entire saga. That moment when Yoda redirected Force Lightning expanded the universe like no other in Star Wars in years. That was so brilliant, especially for its time, as we never as Star Wars fans saw that level of force use. It was goddamn awesome, not to mention Yoda kicking so much ass when he fought Count Dooku. Holy shit, it was incredible, outstanding. For you to say otherwise, you can kiss my ass. It was excellent, don't even go this. I don't even need to explain why. I'm just gonna show you guys a clip of the fight and I want you to know that I did not alter it in any way. This is the most boring choreography I've ever seen. The only time it's visually impressive is when Yoda enters the battle. And while it is impressive that the Dooku stunt double is fighting with literally nothing and somehow making it look convincing, it doesn't change that this is by far what I consider to be the biggest problem with these movies. This problem is at the core of what I hate about the prequels. And that problem is Yoda. It absolutely blows my mind that people don't have a bigger problem with Yoda in this trilogy. Because if you ask me, this is blatant character assassination. That problem is Yoda. No, shut the fuck up. Don't fucking start with that bullshit of, oh, Yoda is a problem because he has a lightsaber. Because he commanded an army. Because, oh, that's blatant character assassination after what happened to Luke in The Last Fucking Jedi. I don't want to hear that. 
so hypocritical when he went from saving Vader, Vader to trying to kill a kid over a vision. Seeing Yoda with a lightsaber fills me with so much dread and honestly, I can't explain it. Remember when I praised the scene from Empire where he has this beautiful speech about the Force? Well, all of that understanding and wisdom is gone in these movies. Yoda never makes a single good decision in these movies, and it's because he always says, Oh, the dark side is clouding my judgment. Come the fuck on, man. I need real plot elements because this shit isn't working. I should never see Yoda directing troops of soldiers. I should never hear Yoda say these words. Concentrate all your fire on the nearest starship. Seeing Yoda doing ninja flips is just so upsetting for me. And maybe this is why I like that Luke dies without hitting anybody with a lightsaber. I have my problems with The Last Jedi, but this is how a Jedi should operate in my mind. I love that once Luke arrives on the scene, nobody else dies for the rest of the movie except for him. A Jedi should work hardest to find a solution without resorting to violence. Now Yoda, there's no comparison. Yes, he commanded cl the clones. Yeah, because the Jedi finally had an army to fight, they tried using an army. The very movie you claim should be erased. Do you know what could happen if you don't have an army? A planet like Naboo can have a greedy trade federation blockaded over greed. And without an army, what can the Jedi do but send like one or two to call the issue? But that wasn't enough, so yes. And when they do get an army, hence the Clone Wars, what are they gonna do? Not fight by the clone side? Not command them? They have to, it's a war, that's the point, genius. That's not contradicting his character in Empire. He had a lightsaber in the prequel trilogy 30 years ago, but years later he doesn't have one. So what? Why does that matter? That at one point Yoda had a lightsaber, and at another point he didn't wield one. That What does that have to do with his character? So what? It's a lightsaber and it's very meaningful. But Yoda is defined by who he is, not by his lightsaber. Oh, because he proved you didn't need a lightsaber to wield the force? Great, and proved it without needing a lightsaber. He didn't have one then. Incredible, yet years ago, he used to wield one. So how does that take away from such an incredible scene? It doesn't. All it means is that he didn't wield a lightsaber to wield the force. But years prior, he used to wield a lightsaber himself. Then you bring up Luke and say, oh, Jedi's must find a solution with the least amount of violence. Okay, but his death was still empty, not because he used the least amount of violence. He spared Darth Vader's life, and guess what? That was the least amount of violence. However, it was satisfying and fulfilling to see. However, in The Last Jedi, a force projection, him trying to kill a kid, the exact opposite of satisfying. And yet you claim, oh, Yoda's was character assassination? You don't think him throwing the lightsaber? You don't think him trying to kill a kid or contemplating it as character assassination? In episode 3, when Obi-Wan begs Yoda and says, please Yoda, don't make me kill Anakin, Yoda says, sorry bro, you gotta do what you gotta do. In these movies, Yoda's number one solution is to kill the bad guys. He never at any point tries to negotiate, he always goes in guns blazing. They go in guns blazing. Yes, they have a clone army that they have to command. So if they have an army that they have to command, so what? That's why the Jedi Order has an army, has the military force. The reason why they have this is because they have the clone army. The CAS has their own military force and they're taking over too many systems for the Jedi to only complete things in a peaceful manner. They have to fight the army in order to win the war and protect other systems. So yes, Yoda commands. So yes, Jedi's work and fight alongside clones. And this is not breaking character as even in A New Hope, Obi-Wan referenced the Clone Wars. So if that's the case, how is that remotely contradictory to the original trilogy? Or to Yoda. You didn't prove that. If they referenced the Clone Wars, wouldn't you assess that the Jedi fought it? Guess what? That includes Yoda too. This isn't Yoda. This isn't how Jedi are supposed to work. There's zero nuance and zero subtlety. These movies just tell you flat out what is going to happen, and then those events happen. There's nothing to surprise you, and there's nothing to enjoy. Along the way, you're gonna see classic characters acting stupid, acting out of character, but no, remember, these are the movies that are better than the new movies. Remember guys, these movies understand Star Wars. The Last Jedi isn't a real Star Wars movie, but this one is. This one gets to be a real Star Wars movie, and guess what guys? We still have one more to go. Three out of 10, I hate that you all made me do this. 3 out of 10, wow. 
one of the most coherent and cohesive Star Wars films out of the saga, and the best you could give it is a 3 out of 10? Your review, 3 out of 10. This is it, guys. The last prequel. And this is the one that people say is the good one. The good one? Shut up. It's one of the most thought-provoking, intense, intelligent, fun, and creative films of our generation. This movie has so many compelling and charming moments, and has intellect, depth, and so many errors you will never see in any other movie. So don't give me that, it's the good one shit. Get the fuck out of here. The movie has a hell of a lot more depth and charm in many areas than what you've stated. That doesn't do it justice. The movie is an outstanding piece of cinema. And I will admit that it's not nearly as bad as the other two. But it's still not good. Watching Attack of the Clones really fucked me up guys but I'm gonna be honest when I got to this movie I was ready to tear into it but it's not as bad as I remember but it's actually not that bad yeah it's kind of hard to tear into a movie that actually has quality however this movie still has all the same problems as the last two except this time you don't feel like you're in a coma while you're watching it this is the movie that people meme on the most and I think these memes have kind of convinced everyone that this movie's better than it is you think memes convince people the movie's better than it is this is below the surface level of understanding of the film first off it couldn't be the thought-provoking dialogue it couldn't be the world building or cinematography it couldn't be the unique characterization it couldn't be the poetic connections to the original trilogy and old school filmmaking you know the fact that george lucas brought the cubic era to the star wars universe no it's just because of some memes wow because if we have all these fun memories of it then it can't be that bad of a movie right kind of reminds me of another movie i've talked about with a rabid fan base oh i'm just goofing new boot goofing now this movie is set during the clone war war <laughs> This title crawl explains that Coruscant was attacked and Palpatine was kidnapped off screen. What the fuck, man? Now, yeah, you're supposed to watch the Clone Wars cartoon to see that stuff happening. And it's really cool in that show. But come the fuck on, dude. If I'm showing someone these movies for the first time, this is the dumbest shit ever. This incredibly significant event is just not shown at all. Honestly, that would have been a really fucking cool intro to the movie. Yeah, it would have made the movie really long, but I don't know. You can trim some of this other dumb shit. Is there any significance to the Kashyyyk scenes? No. They just wanted to show us Chewbacca. And why does Chewbacca look like that? Is it just me or does he look weird in this movie? What's wrong with your face? Oh, also, the title crawl tells us that there are heroes on both sides. Evil is everywhere. What the fuck does that mean? There aren't any heroes on the evil side. George, you need to proofread your work. So anyway, this movie starts with something unique to Star Wars. A long take. And right off the bat, it shows us that this movie is actually fucking trying. Now, some people would say that a long take doesn't count if it's a CGI long take, but that's not actually true at all. It actually takes a lot of work to have a computer render this much shit all at once without cutting. The guys over at the Corridor crew actually have a really good video explaining this better than my dumbass can. Basically, artists have to go in and then little by little they build up pieces of it on like individual simulations or setups or environments and they render them all out one by one. They just put it all together layer by layer. So yeah, I think this is a really cool opening, only ruined by the fact that we need to watch Anakin fight these dumb gimmicky robots. And that's kind of a problem that this whole movie has. You might find yourself almost enjoying a scene, but it just doesn't stop. You might find yourself enjoying a scene, but it just doesn't stop. Wow, that isn't a flaw of the film. You do realize that, right? Oh, the scene just doesn't stop, so what? Okay, the scene, it's long or slow. How is that a flaw again? Tell me what's wrong with the scene. Break that down. What is actually wrong with the scene itself? The scenes in this movie go on for way too long. They really overstay their welcome. Oh, also, we now have Anakin doing something that he didn't do at all in the last movie. Good deeds. I'm gonna go help them out. See, in episode two, Anakin is really fucking sinister. But it feels like George was like, oh shit, I made him too evil. I gotta remind people that he's supposed to be a good guy. And now in this movie, he feels like a completely different character than he was in the last one. But these jarring character shifts are not justified within this narrative. Anakin feels like a completely different character from the last, and that's a flaw to you? It's years after he developed over time, that's the point. That's why there's gaps of time in between films. There's not only development on screen, but some of it is off screen as well. We are supposed to see him killing Dooku as a bad thing, 
but based on everything we've seen in the series so far, there's nothing wrong with him killing Dooku. Nobody said Obi-Wan was supposed to spare Darth Maul. Our heroes never spared any of the enemies they've been mindlessly mowing down. I just like to think that everybody told Anakin that bad guys have to stand trial, even though they don't follow that rule themselves. Again, if you stop to think about the movie, it makes a lot less sense. This is the movie where Anakin's supposed to fall to the dark side, but his fall is not very convincing. From a storytelling perspective, it makes no sense that he changes his mind so quickly based on no information. But anyway, we'll talk more about that when we get to the actual shift in morality. Daddy? Do I look <laughs> As a whole, this opening encounter isn't really all that bad. There's even some cute banter between Obi-Wan and Anakin. But this is really distracting to me because this is the first time out of all the prequels where you feel like the story being told to you is actually worth telling. This is the only sequence out of all of the movies that's almost consistently enjoyable. If I could rewrite the prequels, I would just have them set during this movie. If I were to rewrite the prequels, I, I just have them set in this movie. Movie Revenge of the Sith. Um, no, because you can't just sit there and have all that context build up and development out, uh, out the window. How did things get started? The Trade Federation, the Techno Union. What happened to Anakin? <laughs> How did he get into the Jedi Order? He was on Tatooine and he was a kid. What about an army? When did the Clone Wars happen? And why? They used to have no military force, so Padme, Jar Jar, and Qui-Gon formulated the Gungan Alliance to help stop the Naboo invasion. So when you see Attack of Clones, you understand why they have an army. When you see Revenge of the Sith, you understand why Anakin turned to the dark side, and why the conflict is happening on this grand scale. You wouldn't without the other movie's context. Get that false argument out of here. If we put the romantic subplot and the Jedi-Sith conflict into the backdrop of the war, it makes things a lot more exciting. I mean, this shit's called Star Wars, and episodes 1 and 2 don't even take place during a war. Yeah! I don't have a lot of bad things to say about the opening of this movie, except that it does kill the pacing a lot. The first quarter of this movie is pretty exciting, but then the movie gets really boring. One of the worst things about this movie is that a majority is based around our characters standing in these cold, lifeless CG environments spewing bad dialogue. So beautiful. It's only because I'm so in love. No. <laughs> No, it's because I'm so in love with you. I don't want to watch these movies anymore, guys. I want it to be over. The middle chunk of this movie makes one giant mistake in my mind. It splits up Obi-Wan and Anakin. In this opening scene, we get to enjoy our main heroes being together. For the first time out of any of these movies, we actually enjoy watching the main characters and then George just splits them up and has them go on their own adventures. And General Grievous is such a weird character to me because I know he only exists so that we can have a cool fight with Obi-Wan in the middle of the movie. The villains in these prequels are just so bad. Darth Maul is cool, but he gets kicked out of the movies immediately and doesn't even like have any lines. Count Dooku is probably the worst Star Wars character of all time. His existence is truly baffling to me and he never develops into a real character. Most importantly, he never becomes a real threat. Count Dooku is the worst Star Wars character of all time. How? He used to be in the Jedi Order, then he defected and left and turned into a Sith Lord, yet he had contemplations about killing someone he was companions with, Obi-Wan, considering he trained Qui-Gon. That's a lot of history and depth behind a character. He even told Obi-Wan, join me so we can destroy the Sith Lord. And you're not going to acknowledge the decent characterization and even depth put into the character? Even with this knowledge, the characters have a lack of energy. No, they are taking the situation seriously, plus there's tons of moments of charm, depth, and wit from its characters, and even chemistry, so to say that after seeing this film is wrong. And now, with very little believable internal conflict, we get Anakin just deciding on a whim that he is going to murder everyone he knows and loves. And this is the main problem with this movie. The whole purpose of this movie is to show his turn to the dark side but that should have been the point of all of these movies, not just this one. His conflict doesn't exist at all in Episode 1, and it's not connected to the plot of Episode 2. If you remove his conflict from that story, it doesn't change anything. So as a result, it leads to this movie feeling rushed. It leads to a turn to the dark side that's not satisfying to watch, because this is the first real movie where we've watched it happen. It leads to a turn to the dark side that's not satisfying to watch. Yes, it is. And it's incredible because he has a legitimate reason for turning. First off, after what happened to Shmi in Attack of the Clones, that would make sense that Anakin is not adamant about having a vision of Padme dying. 
so he'd want to save her, even if it meant turning away. Plus, you saw the conflicts with Anakin and the Jedi Order, which are compelling to see, showing that the Jedi Order doesn't see him as a master, but they'd allow him on the council, because he's the chosen one, so there's huge conflicts there. And that's compelling because Anakin isn't perfect, and neither is the Jedi Order. And seeing this dynamic while Padme could die, and he also wants to save her, this combination is compelling and engrossing to see in the movie. You gotta acknowledge what they did right as well. Don't just highlight one slight thing and disregard what they actually got right. And then we have General Grievous, who appears out of nowhere just so Obi-Wan can fight something in the middle of the movie and we can sell some toys or something. And then Palpatine is our main villain, but he barely has any screen time until this movie. If you ask me, we should have just had Palpatine and Darth Maul in all three movies. Narratively, it doesn't change very much in the story, and it would have just cemented Maul as a true threatening force. If Darth Maul and Obi-Wan actually had this rivalry throughout all of the movies, that would be the coolest shit ever. I'd probably care a little bit more. But anyway, I'm complaining too much. I should probably talk more about this movie specifically. It's just really hard to reiterate the same problems I've already talked about in length in this very video. I can only say so many times that the writing is bad, because it is, and it's bad in all of these movies. I've already proven that. It's not fun to sit and watch this movie play catch up and try to prove to us that Anakin isn't totally evil, and to prove to us that him and Palpatine are friends. It leads to this movie having two modes, way too rushed or way too slow. I feel like I could take so many scenes from this movie and either cut them out completely or trim them down. The whole Grievous fight is so stupid and it's just in the movie to stave off our boredom. Yoda on Kashyyyk is just here to give us more fan service, and beyond that we just have more more characters talking about politics. What was it about politics that had George so horny? I don't think I'll ever understand. And George will be the number one guy to tell you that Star Wars is for kids. Come on, man. George Lucas, swear to me on your life that you wrote these scenes with children in mind. Will you defer your motion to allow a commission to explore the validity of your accusations? So anyway, this movie only really starts being interesting again once they find out that Palpatine is a Sith Lord. A Sith Lord? But even with this knowledge, the movie still has a distinct lack of energy. We must move quickly if the Jedi Order is to survive. Whoa guys, slow down, my heart's racing. I actually do like slower scenes like this where it's just Anakin realizing that he's gonna risk it all and interfere with Palpatine's arrest. It's just him wordlessly going through this problem, and for once, it's the movie showing subtlety. The one thing I've craved this whole time. But honestly, it is too little, too late. This is halfway through the last movie, and we finally have a scene where our main protagonist is showing his internal conflict in a realistic and believable way. Keep in mind that this internal conflict is the entire reason these prequels exist. And now at the end of the movie, we have the last of the dumb shit. The final battle in this movie is pretty important for these characters, but the fight between Obi-Wan and Anakin is too long. This might be hard to believe, but are you aware that nobody gives a shit? Obi-Wan and Anakin fight. This fight, holy shit, was outstanding. This fight was really something. It was absolutely something and felt so satisfying and compelling. Anakin had a good reason for his fall, so you felt bad. However, he is the chosen one, so he has a higher level of force sensitivity too. The emotion, the depth behind this fight. Then Obi-Wan, after all his character development, he became strong and also had a higher level of force sensitivity. To see his brother in arms fall like this is sad, compelling, and incredible to watch on screen. So when they had this fight, it was outstanding. It was fucking badass. Holy shit, this fight was goddamn outstanding. It was so damn compelling and showed so much skill and depth of the force and everything. This fight is legendary. Are you dumb? And now at the end of the movie, we have the last of the dumb shit. The final battle in this movie is pretty important for these characters but the fight between Obi-Wan and Anakin is too long. The fight is too long. You always gotta find something to bitch about. The scene is incredible, but of course you'll trash with, oh, it would be good, but it's too long, quote unquote. Being long is not a bad thing automatically. Who cares if it's long, as long as it's good? Talk about bias. And I shouldn't even have to explain why I don't like this fight. This is a fight between two characters that I don't want to see in a fight scene. But I'd honestly probably hate it less if it didn't end in a ridiculous way. Yoda doesn't even really lose. They hadoken each other and he kind of just gets knocked down. And then he's like, it is over. I have failed. 
time to go into exile. What the fuck? You didn't even try! Why is this movie so obsessed with just bringing every element back to where we expect it to be for the status quo of the original trilogy to be intact? If Yoda tried to win, but then failed and was like, okay, well Obi-Wan and I will keep trying, better luck next time, I wouldn't even fucking question it. I wouldn't have left the theater like, Hey, what the fuck? He didn't go into exile. There's still 19 years of story development between these two movies. I wouldn't mind if you left some threads open. I wouldn't mind if you left some threads open. The movie closes things up, but it does have some material and threads left open for storytelling. Yoda goes to Dagobah. What happens when he does? Hmm. Second off, Obi-Wan goes to Tatooine. What happened when he decided to live there? Did he watch over Luke? Hmm. No threads being left open, huh? They shouldn't have just given up after this one attempt. If they both went in to kill Palpatine after this, they probably would have won. That makes the conclusion really weak and unsatisfying. It is a conclusion that makes our heroes seem decidedly unheroic, because they just give up. As a whole, I think it's kind of hard to say any more about this movie that I didn't already cover in the other reviews, because I don't think it's fair to judge these three movies individually. You have to look at them as a unified picture because that was what George intended. So while this movie isn't the worst out of all of them, I still can't forgive it too much. It still has bad pacing, a stupid if understandable storyline, and more of the George Lucas brand bad dialogue. Don't make me kill you. 5 out of 10, an improvement, but not enough of an improvement. 5 out of 10 review for the single greatest Star Wars film of all time that had outstanding cinematography, some great characterization, and even some of the best dialogue and lines. Not to worry, we're still flying half a ship. That's some compelling dialogue, dude. For a bunch of people who claim the dialogue was bad, I thought you said it was bad. Wow. 5 out of 10 review. So that was it. The roughest patch in all of Star Wars. The worst of it is over. And I decided a long time ago, before the new movies came out, that we would never see a Star Wars movie as good as A New Hope. And similarly, we would never see a Star Wars movie as bad as Episode One. And for a while, I thought I was right. I thought, if anything, these new Disney movies would be safe and inoffensive. And I have never been more wrong in my entire life. To be continued, it's finally over. Cosmonaut is biased towards the prequels, it's not even funny. Regurgitating the same points as Plinkett. And you didn't even thoroughly analyze the films you talked about. Not understanding the plot of A Phantom Menace, but he's speaking with authority on it. Wow. Welp, this was Tarragon, and I'm refuting Cosmonaut's claims about the prequels. Thank you for watching.